Uh, therefore, it is now time. <laughs> therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Premier and her Cabinet will be meeting with the Quebec Cabinet this weekend, and my question is for the Premier. Historically, this has meant hydro ratepayers in Ontario are about to be on the hook for another secret deal to import power that we do not need. So, Mr. Speaker, I have a very direct question, and that is, will the Premier be signing a contract this weekend? Will she be importing more Quebec power that Ontario does not need? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I would just say to the, uh, to the Leader of the Opposition that actually there will be no uh, new contract signed this, uh, this week, Mr. Speaker. But I would also say to him that uh, I think it makes eminent sense that Ontario and Quebec would work together, Absolutely. Mr. Speaker. We are actually going to be holding our seventh joint cabinet meeting, Mr. Speaker, because Central Canada is a very important part of this country, Mr. Speaker, the majority of the population, the majority of the contribution to the GDP. So, Mr. Speaker, it only makes good sense that Ontario and Quebec would work together, that we would find ways to collaborate on innovation, Mr. Speaker, and, Mr. Speaker, to work together on uh, agreements that will benefit both provinces on energy, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, when the Premier says work together, I wonder if that's code for negotiate. If Ontario does sign a new deal with Quebec, and if it is anything like the deal that we saw in the newspapers this summer, Ontario Order. will be on the hook for more power we do not need. In fact, Ontario doesn't need this power. Based on what we saw in the newspapers, let alone the eight terawatt hours of hydropower from Quebec that was covered in the papers that was suggested was proposed. Just last year, this government wasted 7.6 terawatt hours of clean wow. electricity, most of it clean green electricity, most of it spilling our hydroelectric, uh, hydroelectric power. So, Mr. Speaker, I know the Premier has said they're not, be, they're not going to be signing a Question. deal this weekend. Are there negotiations right now for such a deal? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear that the Leader of the Opposition is talking about a deal that was rejected, Mr. Speaker. It was not signed, Mr. Speaker, because, Mr. Speaker, we are always looking for ways to work with, with Quebec, with other provinces, with states, Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, to find ways to enhance our capacity in this province. As I said, Mr. Speaker, whether that is in innovation, whether that is in energy, Mr. Speaker, or beyond that, Mr. Speaker, whether it's in education. So we will continue to look for partners. We will find ways to work together as we have in the past. And Mr. Speaker, as I said, later this week, our two cabinets will, uh, will be hosting a joint meeting in Quebec City. Um, and that is, that is, Mr. Speaker, our fourth consecutive annual meeting. But our government, Mr. Speaker, has met with the, uh, the uh, cabinet of Answer. Quebec over the last number of years. And Mr. Speaker, I will also be addressing the National Assembly, yeah. the first thing outside of Quebec to do so. You see it, please. You see it, please. Final supplementary. Finding more coal plants. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Once again, the Premier says work together and doesn't say there's no negotiations. You know, in the summer when we saw this deal that appears to be scuttled by the media reports, you know, we, saw, we heard what stakeholders said about the negotiations and what was proposed. The Society of Professional Engineers said, I certainly see Quebec's interest, interest reflected in the deal. Ontario's interests are not so clear. The Association of Power Producers of Ontario said, Ontario already has a surplus of energy, so it's very difficult to see how this deal or any other sole source deal with Quebec could benefit the province or its ratepayers. So, once again, a very specific question, not about what the Premier is doing in Quebec. Are there negotiations right now for another sole source Good deal question. that benefits Quebec instead of Ontario? Are, are there any conversations? Are there any negotiations? Thank Ontarians you. deserve to know. Here, here. Here. So, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear that what the Leader of the Opposition is asking is, 
Are we, as a government, talking to Quebec or are officials uh, from Ontario talking to Quebec officials in the name of finding an agreement that would benefit Ontario, Mr. Speaker, as we have in the past? Um, previous discussions have led to uh, last year's agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Mr. Speaker, uh, and lower costs to Ontario ratepayers by $70 million, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, so, if the leader thing. of the opposition is asking, are officials engaged in a conversation with Quebec that is ongoing that could lead to further deals, Mr. Speaker, further agreements that would be beneficial to Ontario, would reduce Order. costs for Ontario? The answer is yes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Premier. Since I can't get an answer on the Premier's job-creating plan for Montreal, I'll try— Stop the clock, please. Come to order. Start the clock. Question, please. Mr. Speaker, I hope the Premier got a chance to see the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers report this summer. They crunched the numbers, and the numbers were shocking. It showed Ontario wasted $1 billion worth of clean electricity last year. Now, I know a billion dollars is nothing to this government. There's too many billion-dollar scandals to count. But, Mr. Speaker, this is different. That could have powered 760,000 homes. Mr. Speaker, how does this government justify flushing a billion dollars worth of clean, green electricity Question. down the drain? And how do they justify this while pursuing contracts for Thank more you. generation? Peter. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Of Economic Development and Growth. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, what the Leader of the Opposition is saying is that we shouldn't have surplus power ever in the province of Ontario. We remember the days, Mr. Speaker, when that philosophy drove our energy system. We remember the days where there were generators on the front lawns at Queen's Park because we didn't have enough power to meet demand. What the Leader of the Opposition either refuses to understand or comprehend or doesn't understand or comprehend is that our nuclear units are going to be coming out of service as our nuclear power is going to be regenerated. Mr. Speaker, as that happens, we will need that surplus power. Yeah. So we're planning ahead to ensure we don't do what those guys did, Mr. Speaker, and leave this power in a, this province in a position where we don't have enough power to meet our yes, corporate sir. demand, our industrial demand, and the demand for our households, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. for energy. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier, and I get why she doesn't want to be on the record on this. The Ontario Engineers past president noted this is a 58 per cent increase in wasted clean green electricity since 2015, and next year could be worse. He said this is occurring all while the province continues to export more than two million homes worth of electricity to neighboring jurisdictions for a price less than it costs to produce. So let's break this down, Mr. Speaker. The government flushes away more than a billion dollars worth of power, and then they export millions of homes worth of power at a loss to the United States and other provinces. And at the same time, the people of Ontario struggle to pay their hydro bill. Mr. Speaker, how does this make any sense? Question. How can they continue to flush power down the drain while exporting power for a loss? Will the Premier please answer? Thank you. No, sir. Mr. Speaker, we've worked very hard to build a clean, reliable, and affordable energy system. And the fact that we're taking 25 per cent off the bills on average of Ontario residents is something that Ontario residents greet with good news even if it's bad political news for the, for the member opposite. And, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. This leader has absolutely no plan whatsoever. It's been 202 days since the leader of the opposition promised to come up with this new plan. A lot has changed in that time, Mr. Speaker. Spring has turned into summer, and now summer, summer's turning into fall. Our kids have finished grade one and started another from grade. Prince Edward the Hastings. entire baseball season has already come and gone. Even the NHL playoffs have finished, and now a new season is right around the corner. Mr. Speaker, I could go on and on. We're never going to get a plan from the member opposite because he has no plan. He's a nowhere man with a nowhere plan, Mr. Speaker. Thank we you. have a plan that's delivering a Thank you. Final supplementary. 
Land's killing us. Mr. Speaker, for a third time, my question is for the Premier. The past president of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers added this. He said, the numbers show that Ontario's cleanest source of power is literally going down the drain, literally going down the drain, according to Ontario's engineers. That's power that Ontario could have used and eliminated the need to sign contracts for more imported power. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier continue to let Ontario's cleanest source of electricity be poured down the rain? Rather than attack others, I want to know why they've allowed this hap to happen. Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier hate Ontario's beautiful, clean, green hydroelectric power? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we're the only party in this legislature that has a long-term energy plan that will provide a clean, reliable, affordable energy system. The member opposite has no plan whatsoever, Mr. Speaker. No plans for clean energy, no plan for a reliable energy system, and certainly no plan to, to reduce energy rates. In fact, he opposed our plan to bring down energy costs by 25 per cent. To quote the Beatles, Mr. Speaker, and I've wanted to do this for a long time, he's a real nowhere man, sitting in his nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. He doesn't have a point of view, and he knows not where he's going to, but we do, Mr. Speaker, and that's to a clean, reliable, and affordable energy system for the province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. You see it, please? Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On Thursday, MPPs passed an NDP motion calling on the government to immediately expand the mandate of the wet law for long-term care inquiry. That motion demanded that the government take a, a hard look at the systemic problems in seniors' care in this province. Will the Premier listen to the Legislature, listen to countless families, and move today to immediately expand the public inquiry to look into the crisis in seniors' care? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will want to comment on the, uh, the details, but let me, let me be clear, Mr. Speaker. Um, as I read the, uh, the terms of reference for uh, the review of the um, case, Mr. Speaker, my understanding is that there is plenty of scope in those terms of reference to actually allow for um, uh, an investigation if there is a systemic issue that arises in the process of looking at this, uh, at this one case, Mr. Speaker. And I was very clear as we went into uh, this process, uh, I was very clear about asking that question, Mr. Speaker, because I think if there are systemic issues that are raised, I completely agree with the leader of the third party that those systemic issues need to be uh, need to be explored but mr speaker all of that is within the context of the terms of reference that begin with this particular case thank you supplementary well, Speaker, it's a pretty sad day when the Premier of the province doesn't realize that her public inquiry is tied to the wet law for murders or other uh, uh, situations similar. That's what her inquiry does. That's why everybody in this House, including some of her own cabinet ministers, decided to support our motion, because everybody realizes we have a growing horrific crisis in long-term care, and we need to be honest about that and address it. And the best way to do that is to ask the hard questions and come up with the recommendations that will happen through the proper scoped uh, public inquiry. So my question is back to the Premier Speaker. Why does her Liberal government, why does her, her, her Minister of Health refuse to acknowledge what everybody in this House acknowledged last week, and that is that we need a broader scoped public inquiry to get to the problems in our long-term care system? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Serve health, long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, this is uh, an issue of great uh, import to the province, uh, and particularly to those families and friends and loved ones uh, of those uh, who are now deceased as a result of the murders that took place 
uh, in Woodstock and in London, the assaults that took place as well, and our heart goes out to those uh, individuals. And that is the primary focus of why, uh, in response to Ontarians and many, many stakeholders asking us to launch a public inquiry, we did precisely that. And I'm very, and I'm very uh, confident that Justice Gillies will do the proper analysis, make the correct determinations, consult widely and broadly and publicly, and arrive at a set of recommendations so that we hopefully can Answer. prevent this type of tragic situation ever occurring again, Mr. Speaker. And that includes if necessarily looking at issues. Thank you. Final supplementary. Seniors' care is at a breaking point in this province. The frontline staff are doing the best that they can, but people are left in bed 18 hours without even having any personal contact from a worker in the facility. There are people who are missing meals, Speaker, in long-term care. There are 30,000 people on the wait list for long-term care. This House said that a public inquiry should take a hard look at the levels of staffing, for example, and funding in long-term care. It should ask the government ask about the government's inaction uh, after many years now on countless recommendations that have come forward but nothing has been done to fix the system it needs to look really honestly at the systemic problems that we have in long-term care problems that so many families are up at night worried sick about their loved ones in uh, in long-term care so will this premier do the right thing speaker Question. will she do the right thing expand the public inquiry today or will we have yet another excuse and another premier sweeping Thank all of you. this under the carpet Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we owe it to Ontarians to get to the answers that they are asking for. And we intentionally drafted the terms of reference for the Gillies inquiry to be very broad, precisely for that reason, Mr. Speaker, including the potential to look at systemic issues of oversight and accountability throughout the long-term care uh, system, Mr. Speaker, and it includes she can look at it's in the terms other relevant matters that the commissioner considers necessary to avoid similar tragedies, and these are tragedies of safety and security and well-being of people in our long-term care. Just order, please. Thank you. Wrap up, please. Mr. Speaker, I trust Justice Galiz to get to the answer, to have a broad inquiry, to answer the questions that Ontarians are asking Thank right you. before. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. On Thursday, this legislature also passed the NDP's bill through second reading to set up a dedicated ministry for mental health and addictions. I believe it's time to bring mental health care and addiction services out of the shadow, Speaker, and give them the funding and resources and attention that they deserve. But somehow, this Liberal government voted against this crucial bill. Why is the Premier refusing to take this important step forward to help people who are suffering and desperately need better mental health and addictions care here in Ontario? Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, you know, I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the question uh, from the leader of the third party, and I also appreciate the idea of setting up a, a separate ministry. Um, Mr. Speaker, what we know is needed for all the reasons that the leader of the third party identified, that um, this is an area of health that has lived in the dark corners of our society. Mr. Speaker, there has not been enough, enough light shone on it, and there has not been the resource that is needed to, uh, to allow people to get the supports that they, uh, that they require. And so what, what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is we're working to put those, resor those resources in place. We're actually increasing the funding to mental health services and doing, Mr. Speaker, the work that needs to be done. You know, if at some point, Mr. Speaker, there needs to be a conversation about the change, uh, a change in the way uh, those funds are administered or the way the ministries are Answer. organized, I'm open to that, Mr. Speaker, but the reality is we need to get money into the hands of people on the ground who are delivering those services, and that's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, mental health and addiction care has been an afterthought for this government for far too long, and it's about time we change that. People in crisis should never have to wait for the care that they need, and this government knows that people are waiting far too long for the care that they need. Speaker, children shouldn't be stuck on waiting lists for help Minister for a year and a half. Young people should never have to suffer the pain of losing a parent, let alone both parents, to mental health 
and addictions issues, but for seven years this government has sat on its hands and failed to transform mental health and addictions care so that it's actually there for people when they need it. Why won't the Premier do the right thing? Dedicate a ministry to fixing the system, fixing the problem, and deliver the help that people need. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, if I believed that changing the name of a ministry, Mr. Speaker, would solve the problem of mental health in this province that has been with us for decades, Mr. Speaker, I would do it in a minute. But that's not the case. It's and it is also not the case that we have not addressed this challenge, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that we have a societal issue that people across the country, when I sit with premiers from across the country, every single one of them is dealing with these challenges. That's the reason, Mr. Speaker that when the federal government put in place the new health agreement, with which I was not particularly happy, Mr. Speaker, because it did not meet the needs of uh, any of the provinces, but there was a component, Mr. Speaker, of mental health dollars that would flow to the province, and there was a recognition that this is a challenge across the country. So the fact, Mr. Speaker, that in February we announced additional immediate investments of $140 million over three years, Mr. Speaker, that we have put an additional $100 million into treatment for youth and children, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we continue to make investments and to change the system so that people can Thank find you. their way through it and get the services that they need. Thank you. Start the clock. Final supplementary. What is the case, this, uh, Speaker? What is the case is that this government, this Liberal government, has had seven years to implement the recommendations from the Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions, and they still haven't done it, Speaker. Seven years later, those recommendations sit gathering dust. Today, 12,000 children are waiting for care in this province. Young people are waiting up to 18 months to get mental health services. We're in the midst of an emergency of opioid overdose, overdose deaths, even though the Premier refuses to call it what it is. And after so many years, Ontario still does not have a functioning mental health and addictions system in our province, leaving people in crisis to fall through the enormous cracks that exist. If seven years wasn't long enough, Speaker. How much longer does this Premier think people should have to wait for the resources and attention Question. that mental health and addictions absolutely need today? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term well, Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's just not true that we we have been investing. We have more than doubled our budget in mental health since coming into office, yeah. Mr. Speaker. That party voted against $140 million of new investments this year alone, including being the first province in the country to fund cognitive behavioral therapy. But it's important that the public and legislatures know that the Select Committee did not recommend setting up a separate Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. It's easy to lift an idea from the NDP party in British Columbia, made the announcement a couple Leader of weeks of the ago, third party. Speaker, but the Select Committee did not that make that recommendation, nor did my Advisory Council on Mental Health Addictions, chaired by Susan Pickett, Mr. Speaker, nor has any stakeholder suggested to me that creating a standalone Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions you would be a positive Answer. thing to better integrating mental health and making sure we reduce and eliminate the stigma and integrate it into the system. There can be no help without mental health, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thanks. My question is to the uh, Minister of Health. Speaker, in 2012, the Liberal government announced an urgent, urgently needed electrophysiology lab for cardiac care at St. Mary's Hospital in Kitchener. After failing to deliver, the minister bowed to pressure and returned to St. Mary's to recommit and reannounce the lab last year. Minister, it's 2017 fall. Will he tell us where that vital lab is today? Thank you. Thank you, Minister Health. Well, it is a good question, and I appreciate it, Mr. Speaker, from the member opposite. Uh, and uh, last year, as the member alluded to, I was in Kitchener for a tremendous announcement at St. Mary's Hospital: a seven million dollar commitment to their cath lab uh, at the hospital. Uh, I know the member opposite uh, saw just how great an announcement it was, Mr. Speaker, because he was present for the announcement and as we did the tour of the hospital. And I, and I appreciated that. Um, and at that point, the program at that point a 
year ago, the program was approved and the money was sent to St. Mary's Hospital. But since then, since that time a year ago, Mr. Speaker, St. Mary's has come back to the Lynn and come back to the province and the ministry asking to further expand that program beyond the $7 million. There, in fact, it would, it would cost an additional $2 million in capital and uh, unknown as of yet yes, operational sir. costs. So now the hospital and the Lynn, appropriately, together with the ministry, are working on that request for the expansion, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, the minister had to be shamed, literally shamed in this House, to force him down to Kitchener for a re-announcement of this vital lab in 2015, 2016, and now we're here again, and he still failed to deliver. Last week, CTV reported the weight that Cassandra Heisman was forced to endure Order. in the past year to be tested and treated before being sent to London for this cardiac procedure. To this day, St. Mary's remains the only one of 11 cardiac hospitals in Ontario still waiting for this vital lab, meaning Cassandra is one of hundreds forced to wait. And yet, the only answers we receive to our questions are disappointing political distractions, of course, from the local government member that should have no part in this discussion. Speaker, this is a dangerous waiting game with our health care priorities. No politics and no more empty promises. Will the minister finally deliver the cardiac lab Question. at St. Mary's that patients in Kitchener-Waterloo and surrounding areas require? Good Question. Question. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the fact is the money that was approved and the money was sent and the program exists and the program is growing as it should be. We did and what they're talking about and what we're very interested in is the request for a further expansion. Just like we approved the project in 2012, but it's a phased well, it's a phase program, right? Because you can't just leap directly to the implantable car to you can't leap right forward to the full cardiac program. So in 2013, they launched their implantable cardioverter cardioverter defibrillator program, an additional two million dollars in funding then. And with these investments, it allowed them to mature as they asked for to be able to develop and implement and provide the full program that was announced a year ago. Seven million dollars in funding provided. Provided. They Remember, come come back order. for a re an additional request to expand that Answer. as a new phase. The Lynn and the hospital and the ministry are looking at it. I think all Ontarians, except that one, Mr. Speaker, would agree that's an Thank appropriate you. process. Yeah. Question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, the Premier of Ontario took the witness stand in the Sudbury bribery case. She seemed to have trouble with her memory, forgetting quite a few details about the interactions between herself and her team and the time that her party uh, was courting the Minister of Energy to run for them. For example, the Premier couldn't remember if she ever talked to the Minister about paid jobs for his staffers. That's a pretty important piece of information. Is the Premier's memory any better now that she's had time to think about it? Speaker, the question is clear. I, I'm, stop the clock, please. I'm listening very carefully to this type of question in the House, and it has to have relevance to the government, and I'm hoping that the member will be able to, uh, throughout her preamble, pull it back to government policy. So I'm going to give you an opportunity—order! I want to give the member an opportunity to relate it to government policy. Please feel free to try. Thank you, Speaker. This would go back to the, to the Premier's accountability and transparency in the province. I would like to know if, she's, if he, she um, and, or her staffers had an exchange with the minister for his staff to agree to run for her party. The clock. Again, I made reference to this last, I think it was last week or the week before, uh, in the relevance to government policy and inside of this court case, there needs to be relevance to the government policy that's happening. Right now, that question has not come to that level of, and standard. If the member cannot rephrase the question to make it government policy, I'm going to ask her to either resubmit a different question or I'll pass. One last time. 
Thank you, uh, Speaker. I would like to know if the Premier has a policy upon, uh, within her transparency and accountability about, account, about her accountability and whether she offered jobs to people in, in the re reduction of people running for her party. And it's, it's accountability and transparency. The people have. Yep. I want to make it clear the member is not uh, complying with what I've asked in terms of policy with regard you're talking about a political party's process and not the government policy. I will offer you an opportunity in your supplementary to start again, and if that does not comply, I'm going to pass the question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. <laughs> It's about Speaker, Speaker, the Premier of this province has claimed time and time again that her government is accountable and transparent. When she was on the stand in Sudbury, she had a different reflection of, her, of, of what had uh, transpired uh, during her interactions with the now Minister of Energy. Does the Premier still agree that she didn't have any recollections, or did she have recollections of, of her, her conversations with the Minister of Energy? Comes down to accountability, Premier. Which is it? That does not, in my interpretation, comply with the standard I've asked you to hit. New question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Let me see if I can make this relevant, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, over the years, many constituents in my riding of Northumberland, Quinty West, have either worked in the nearby General Electric manufacturing plant or know someone close to them who has. I've been following this pro this, uh, the progress of their health case very closely, Speaker. This has been and continues to be a very difficult situation for these workers and their families. Minister, I know you have met with advocates of the workers and the workers themselves many, many times. This year, we, uh, we are making some progress. In the spring, you held three-day information clinic in Peterborough to provide workers and family members information and assistance with their claims. Question. You also established a data working group. Uh, speaker, to the minister, can you tell us what consideration of their cases to the WSIB have been? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to answer this question uh, to the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. And I want to thank my colleague to the right of me, the, uh, the member from Peterborough, the uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture, because it's just an incredible day for the GE workers in Peterborough, Speaker. They've been through such a tough situation for so long. The situation has dragged on for people that were exposed to toxins in the past at the GE plant. So I'm so happy today to rise to speak to the incredible progress we've made by working together on this, Speaker. This week, Speaker, the WSIB announced that they have established a dedicated review team that's going to reopen and review more than 250 cases involving these GE Peterborough workers, Speaker. These cases should have got better examination in the past. They're going to get the proper examination yes, they should get today, Speaker. Ensuring rapid actions and solutions is what we've been about on this. This is a good day for Peterborough, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Peterborough. Well, thank you, Minister. I'm, I'm happy to hear of uh, where we are today. This has been, as I said before, been very difficult and lengthy process for these workers. I believe they deserve the justice they have sought after so, so long, such a long time. I think it's also important that our government is working to prevent this situation from happening again. I have heard you say many times in this House that you work hard every day to ensure Ontario is among the safest places in the world to work. I know you work hard to ensure that people who go to work come home safe and sound at the end of the day. An important part of that is also ensuring that people don't get sick later in life as a result of their work. Minister, what are you and your ministry doing to address occupational diseases around the province? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, 
thank you again to the member for that question. Speaker, employers and employees and organized labor and health and safety organizations and this government, my ministry inspector, Speaker, do work very hard each and every day to ensure that Ontario has become one of the safest places in the world to work and remains one of the safest places in the world to work. Speaker. At the Ministry of Labour, we know it's critical that occupational diseases are treated with exactly the same seriousness as a, an important speaker as physical injuries. We're focused on prevention. Speaker, The cornerstone, what we've been able to learn from this speaker, what we've been able to learn from the GE situation is that we need a dedicated occupational disease response team, Speaker, and that's what we're putting in place in the province of Ontario. It's going to examine, it's going to respond to all aspects of occupational disease exposure. It's going to go from initial yes, reports sir. to enforcement to helping the workers work their way through the claim system, Speaker. It's a huge step forward for safety in the province of Ontario. Thank you. No question. The member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. According to public accounts documents, your government failed to spend nearly $3.3 billion in infrastructure spending during the 2016-17 fiscal year. Ontarians are waiting for essential infrastructure for their communities, from hospitals to highways. Will the minister provide a list of the projects that are now delayed or not started because 20 per cent of the money he promised to communities Minister of Child and Youth Services. Yeah. Minister of Infrastructure. I'm surprised by the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given the extent of infrastructure investments we are making as a government, uh, uh, the member would know that we have uh, a project or a, 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 pro a project to, to move forward uh, over 13 years uh, with uh, 190 billion dollars of infrastructure. Most of that is getting out extremely quickly, Mr. Uh, 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 Speaker, uh, and uh, we don't uh, take uh, uh, any back seat with respect to our investments in infrastructure. It's been very, very well received uh, across the uh, province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we also know uh, that uh, there is a tremendous amount that's coming on track uh, immediately, Mr. Speaker, and that's coming on track, yes, in fact, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in many of the writings that the uh, that the uh, progressive conservative hold, Mr. Speaker, and I'll address that uh, in my supplementary. Supplementary. You know, the, the facts show that 20 percent was not distributed. According to public accounts documents, this shortfall was due to quote lower than forecast cons construction activity for the period. Can the minister tell Ontarians why he failed to get these projects going? Was it red tape? Was it inaction? Or is this another stretch goal? Ontarians expect their government to deliver on their promises, but time and time again, you don't get the job done. All day two-way go to Kitchener, developing the Ring of Fire, go service to Niagara, just to name a few. With so many of your commitments and our communities waiting for action, will the minister table a list of infrastructure projects not started in 2016-17? Mr. Speaker, uh, we have the largest investment in infrastructure in the history of the province of Ontario. And yes, there were some delays because of the processing with the federal government, and some of them have been uh, allocated to all of your ridings. For example, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, if you look at Sarnia Lambton, uh, $8.43 billion dollars mr speaker million dollars mr speaker is allocated it's on track and it's moving forward mr speaker if you look for example at leeds grenville mr speaker 3,269,000 on the clean water program mr speaker uh, if you want to look at uh, uh, kitchener conestoga mr Order. speaker 10,673,000 for water clean water and waste mr speaker we can go on for every member and every yes, to indicate that yes some of this municipality have not been able to deliver the actual shovel in the ground on time, but they're coming, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. They're announced. They're out of. When I stand, you sit. New question to the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. It's been five years since the government passed Toby's Law granting trans folk equal protections under the Ontario Human Rights Code. Yet there is no equality for trans folk when it comes to accessing health care. 
My constituent, Luke Fox, who's here today, has suffered just trying to get basic follow-up care after surgery. The lack of care has left him absolutely housebound. Why is the government denying Luke access to follow-up care? Mr. Speaker, I, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will want to speak to this, but I want to just on this day in particular, I want to acknowledge the work of the member for Parkdale High Park on yeah, this yeah. issue and on so many social issues, Mr. Speaker. She has, she has always been a champion, Mr. Speaker, and I know, I know that uh, the announcement that she made today that she is going to continue to work in the community uh, after the next election. She will continue to work in the community on these issues in particular. Mr. Speaker, it is absolutely our intention that everyone in this province be treated equitably, Mr. Speaker, that they get the supports that they need. And as I say, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will speak to uh, the specifics of this issue. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, that Luke's not the only one. Uh, he's one of many who have been unable to access health care. The government is not even planning on offering many of the surgery options that trans folk need. In Ontario, there are now thousands on wait lists, often under dire circumstances, waiting for necessary care, care that is, five years later, still only available outside the province. When exactly will equality in health care be offered to our trans community? Thank you, Mr. Long-term care. Mr. Health, long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, too, appreciate the advocacy. In fact, this was an issue that the uh, member opposite uh, last week uh, raised with me, and I've subsequently followed up with a meeting with my ministry, uh, because it is an issue that I'm concerned about as well, individuals who go out of province or out of country to, uh, to uh, follow up and complete the, uh, the, the gender-affirming surgery, Mr. Speaker. And, um, but when they come, by, come back, they may have complications, or they may have questions, or the need for further health care, and it's a critically important issue, and I've asked the ministry to begin that process with our stakeholders, with individuals that can provide us with the best advice on uh, what a suitable path forward might be. That being said, and I know there's much more work to be done, but I am proud, Mr. Speaker, of the work that we did that was announced or was became effective last year uh, in the spring, where we changed the system whereby an individual could get Answer. approval for sex reassignment uh, surgery, so that going from one location, we now have literally hundreds of individuals and locations across the province where that process can be uh, sensitively Thank conducted, you. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Your question, the member from Ottawa, Vangie. Mr. President, my question is for the Procureur. My question is for the Attorney General. Harassment and intimidation outside of the Morgan Teller Clinic in my hometown of Ottawa. Women and healthcare providers cannot safely enter nor exit the clinic, and we know that that's not only happening in Ottawa. It's, there's been complaints of harassment in the GTA, in the Peel region, among others. It is important to protect women's right to health care and women's right to choose what happens to their body. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Attorney General please tell us what is the government's plan to protect these rights of women? See, Attorney General. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member from Ottawa, Vanya, for asking a very important uh, question. Uh, Speaker, our government does not tolerate any form of harassment against women exercising their fundamental right to choose. It is also, Speaker, my steadfast belief and that of our government that every woman in Ontario has the right to make decisions about our own health care, and they deserve to do so freely, without fear, without fear for safety, privacy, or dignity, without fear of being judged or publicly humiliated because of her choice, without fear of being threatened with any violence, harassment, or intimidation. Speaker, it is women's right to access health care services, be it abortion services or reproductive health services, without uh, such fear. And our government, Speaker, as I have announced earlier, will bring in necessary legislation to protect women's safe Thank access you. to abortion services in our province. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for his answer and his attention to this uh, 
this uh, problem. I have a further uh, inquiry because I'd like to have more details about the legislation. It's a, a step in the right direction. How this will balance with the right of free speech. Uh, this, uh, the protection of freedom of expression is important in Ontario as well. I, uh, as the former counsel for Canadian Civil Liberties Association, I'm very concerned about that. So uh, can the minister inform us how the bill will reconcile the right of women to access health care and the freedom of expression of anti-abortion protesters? Thank you. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And I cannot get this question than better expert than the member from Ottawa, Venia, being an expert in civil liberties and issues around constitutionality and human rights. So um, I very much appreciate this, this question from the member who taught at, at law school and a practice in the area. Speaker, over the summer, we have been doing ext extensive analysis to answer this very exact question. We have consulted with legal and health experts and pro-choice and anti-choice advocates. It was important for us to hear the voices on all sides of this issue, Speaker. We have also looked to British Columbia, Quebec, and Newfoundland, who have all implemented similar laws in their provinces over the past few decades. Speaker, we also have looked at the courts. Certain abortion clinics in Ontario have had injunctions limiting protests around them for years, providing us with the necessary templates to balance competing rights, not to mention uh, the decisions by the Supreme Court of Canada. Answer. At the end of the day, Speaker, we know that not everyone will agree, but I believe that policies like this are very important now than forever. We need to make sure that we protect Thank women's you. right to safe access to abortion services. Thank you. New question, the member from Boston. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, over the last 10 months, there have been 1,300 layoffs announced in my riding. Three different major factors, including Siemens and Tilsonburg. What does the Premier have to say to all those people who say that they have lost their jobs because of your government's policies? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, I mean, that's a foolish conclusion to come to when you look at what our, our policy has done uh, to drive this economy forward. But let me, let me first uh, reach out and say something about those workers, both in, at Siemens. <coughs> Member from Renfrew and Ipissing, Pembroke, come to order. And a couple of others are close. Carry on. Let me say a few words about those workers that are impacted, Mr. Speaker, from layoffs from time to time, uh, such as the workers in Siemens. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, that was a, a plant that was very valuable to that community. The plant came about because of the policies of this government, the clean energy policies, that made that plant happen and provided those very good jobs for a number of years. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the types of turbines Answer. that were being built there uh, are no longer utilized, and the market for those, those turbines had dried up. It's unfortunate. We will continue to work with those workers. Our hearts go out Thank to you. them, and we'll continue to do everything we can to help them relocate. Supplementary. Thank you very much. Uh, and back to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. With all due respect to the Minister, the people who have lost their jobs want to hear from the Premier on this issue. The election is nine months away, and I don't want to see any more layoffs in Oxford during that time. But our businesses say that with your government's policies, their choices are layoffs or close their doors. Yet your government continues to drive jobs out of Oxford and Ontario by increasing the cost of doing business and making it harder for our companies to compete. Premier, 1,300 jobs lost in Oxford alone should make it clear your policies are not working. Will you commit to change your approach and stop piling new costs and regulations on our business to save the jobs that we have left? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, our, our, as I said, our heart always goes out to workers who find themselves caught in the transition. From time to time, plants do close, and that's part of the transition in our economy. But, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is there has not been a government in this country and very few governments around the world that are performing, that have an economy performing at the level ours is. We have the lowest unemployment rate, Mr. Speaker, in 16 years. Our policies have helped work with our business community to create six, 760,000 net new jobs, 96 per cent of which are full-time. Mr. Speaker, we're leading the G7 in growth. This economy is going well, and for the member to suggest otherwise, Mr. Speaker, is absolutely doing a disservice to the hardworking business people in this province who are helping to yes, drive sir. this economy ahead. 
Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to make those investments to ensure that our economy can continue to grow. Thank you. Yeah. Your question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, since the Liberals took office, Ontario's 24 public colleges have seen an alarming rise in precarious work, to the point that 81 per cent of teaching is now done by contract faculty, with substandard wages, no access to benefits, and no job security. This means that many of Ontario's 500,000 college students are being educated by professionals who are struggling to make ends meet, who are demoralized and stressed out, who are forced to reapply every four months for the job they have been doing for years. Speaker, there is a direct connection between the quality of education for students and the quality of work for faculty. Will the Premier commit today to improving job security for contract faculty in Ontario's 24 colleges? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, London West for that question, and I want to say welcome to all of the OPSU representatives who are here from our college sector today. Uh, speaker, uh, this year we're celebrating 50 years of the college system in Ontario, and I tell you it's been 50 extraordinary years. Uh, the, uh, it is impossible to imagine this province without colleges, and I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to the people who make our colleges great, and that is the faculty in them. I do know, Speaker, that the, the issue of precarious employment in our colleges is a very real and live issue. I know that uh, we are in bargaining, so I will leave the bargaining to the bargaining table. But I do want to say, Speaker, that we recognize this issue, and the Minister of Labour has brought introduced Bill 148 Answer. that actually starts to address this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker, again to the Premier. New Democrats have long supported equal pay for equal work, which is why we pushed for strengthened language in Bill 148, language the Liberals voted against. We heard during committee hearings that Bill 148 provides too much latitude for employers to avoid their equal pay obligations. And given years of Liberal underfunding of the college system, colleges will have an incentive to use the loophole and not move forward with equal pay. Speaker, what will the Premier do to hold Ontario's colleges to, to their equal pay obligations for contract faculty and to ensure that the resources are there to support implementation of equal pay. Thank you. The Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Uh, two approaches to that, uh, uh, to that answer. Obviously, we look at the province of Ontario over the years, the track record we have in reaching collective bargaining agreements without strikes or lockouts, I think is exemplary. It's about 98 or 99 per cent. I'm, 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 um, I'm convinced that that attitude will continue throughout these negotiations as well, Speaker, Positive and that's something that uh, we're always confident that when we work together, uh, we're able to achieve those types of agreements. We have a history of stability. Obviously, Bill 148 is, uh, introduces another angle to this, Speaker. We've gone out, consulted broadly on this issue. We took it out after first reading. The committee had, a, I think, a a long time to hear a variety of views on this, Speaker. Get we stopped. continue to work on it. We continue to debate it in the House, Speaker. It's a, it's a work in progress. But the, the intent, Speaker, is to inject more fairness into the system. Thank you. New question. The member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, and Westdale. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. Speaker, our government, under the stewardship of our Premier, has always taken a leadership role in exploring bold ways to create fairness and opportunity for the people of Ontario. That's what our Fair Workplaces Plan is about. That's what our Fair Hydro Plan is about. That's why anyone 24 years old or younger will be able to get their prescription medications for free. And that's why we launched the Basic Income Pilot in order to test how we can help people living on low incomes better meet their basic needs while improving their health, education and employment outcomes. Speaker, this week is International Basic Income Week. Yeah. And, and I want to ask Question. you to the minister if he could tell members of this House more about Ontario's basic income pilot. Thank you, Minister Responsible for Property Reduction Strategy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Westdale uh, for the question and for his tremendous advocacy on this issue for many years. <laughs> While Ontario's economy is growing and it's strong, many people just aren't feeling that growth in their everyday lives. The three-year basic income pilot will study whether a basic income can better support vulnerable workers and give people living on low incomes the security and opportunity to achieve their potential. What we learn from this pilot will help inform our longer-term plans for income security reform. The pilot was launched this spring in Hamilton, Brantford, Brant County, and Thunder Bay, and later this fall uh, we'll be launching the next phase in Lindsay. In addition, a basic income pilot for First Nations is being co-created with our First Nations partners. Answer. Throughout the summer, we've been holding community information sessions. We're building awareness, and I know the Minister of Community and Social Services will elaborate further in the Thank supplementary. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and to the Minister for his answer. Uh, Speaker, our government recognizes that some Ontarians are struggling to keep up with the rising cost of living. We are working hard to improve the lives of all Ontarians, including and especially our most vulnerable. As we enter International Basic Income Week, a week where activists around the world are combining their efforts to advocate for a basic income, it's important to highlight our government leadership in launching a basic income. Excuse me. I let the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek get away with a walk by heckle, but now I'm going to ask him to refrain. Carry on. And he's a good man. I'm sure he'll do that. Um, it's important to highlight our government leadership in launching a basic income pilot in Ontario as a way to see if there is a better way to help people get ahead and stay Question. ahead. The pilot is an important example of how our government is applying evidence-based policy to promote fairness in the in the economy. Mr. Speaker, Thank you. will the minister tell us more about the pilot? Thank you. <laughs> minister. <laughs> minister of Community and Social to the member for his question, and I'm very pleased to share with you on International Basic Income Week details of our evaluation process. Our ultimate goal is to better understand whether a basic income could provide more opportunity to people living on low incomes and whether it could potentially improve their overall health and educational attainment. Our pilot was designed to ensure that findings from the evaluation are of the highest validity and integrity. To assist with the evaluation, the government has appointed Dr. Dr. Kwame McKenzie as Special Advisor for the Pilots Research and Evaluation Advisory Committee. He is an expert in the field, and his role as Special Advisor will be to provide advice on how to best evaluate the outcomes of the pilot. I'm sure that his expertise will be invaluable as we move forward on this important project. Answer. Thank you. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, earlier this year, the residents of Niagara West Glanbrook found out that the Rivera Long-Term Care is planning to move 50 bed beds out of Killian Lodge in Grimsby down the QEW to Hamilton. Adrian Peters, a retired engineer living in Caster Centre, visits his wife at Killian Lodge every day. Adrian chose Killian precisely because of its location. He'll no longer be able to see his wife every day if she is moved to Hamilton. What action will the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care take to ensure people like Adrian in Niagara will be able to see their loved ones in care? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from the member opposite, and uh, I'm proud to say that we have, uh, since coming into office, built. Uh, 10,000 new long-term care uh, spots. As well, we've redeveloped 13,000, and we're well on our way to our commitment by 2025 to redeveloping 30,000 uh, long-term care beds in this province. In now, as it pertains to this specific proposal, and that's all it is at this point, it is a proposal from Rivera that has come forward to the government, and part of our uh, the approval process, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and there is no guarantee 
of approval, by the way. But part of the process that we require is a robust community consultation. And so that, I believe, is what the member opposite is referencing, in part, that there is now a public consultation being taken so we can legitimately and importantly get feedback from and the sir? very communities and the very families that may be positively or negatively impacted as we continue our deliberations. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Speaker, the reality is that this Liberal government has failed to make the substantial and meaningful investments in long-term yeah. care that are needed for Ontario. This government is failing families not only in Niagara-West Glanbrook, but families like those of Adrian's across all Ontario. Yep. Speaker, after 14 years of Liberal mismanagement, my constituents are rightly concerned that long-term care capacity could be removed from the Niagara region. Beds are being taken away with no plan to replace them. This is unacceptable. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, can families like Adrian's count on more long-term care beds in Niagara, or will they be disappointed once again by this tired Liberal government? Good question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh of course, we're committed to continuing to invest in long-term care. In fact, in the most recent budget that that member and that party voted against, Mr. Speaker, we uh, increased that long-term care budget by an additional $80 million. And importantly, Mr. Speaker, $60 million. Uh, sorry, and that actually that was a 2% increase. It was $80 million this year alone. And part of that was for behavioral supports, which is to accommodate those seniors, those individuals in long-term care who have more complex needs, including, for example, dementia. But we have a very robust—I want to reassure the, the, the member and the community he represents that we have a very robust process where a requirement of any proponent, whether it's creating new beds or shifting, moving beds, uh, that we require them to engage the community, engage uh, those people most affected, and we then receive Answer. that through the LIN, with the LIN's involvement, we receive that as part of our determination whether we should continue this proposal or consider this proposal or not, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Kenora Rainy River. To the Premier. Residents in Kenora Rainy River were shocked last month when they learned that the long delayed twinning of Highway 17 has been delayed yet again. Instead of being completed by 2020, the completion date is now 2021 and beyond, meaning that we really have no idea when this crucial project will be finished. Even more shocking is that instead of accepting responsibility for the delay, the Minister of Northern Development blamed Shoal Lake 39 First Nation. Is this the type of reconciliation we can expect from this government? Minister of Transportation. Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for the question. This is uh, an issue that, uh, over my three years and a little bit as Minister of Transportation, I've had the opportunity to uh, to uh, to work uh, work uh, you know hard on with respect to talking to the communities in the affected area. Speaker, I've not only heard from members from Northern Ontario on our side of the legislature, I've also had the chance to speak with our uh, federal uh, colleague Bob Nault from that uh, particular community and heard from mayors okay. along the way. Speaker, there's what I what I can confirm is right across the north there is a great deal of excitement about the fact that our government is so committed to investing hundreds of millions of dollars in expanding highways in every corner of the North Speaker. In fact, we see in our Northern Highways program more money is dedicated to the expansion of highways than probably at any other time in Ontario history, Speaker. And I also know, Speaker, that not that long ago the Premier herself was actually in Answer. the Kenora area and had the chance to meet with both Shoal Lake 39 and Shoal Lake 40. I can confirm in this legislature that. The Ministry of Transportation will continue to work very closely with all of our partners, including our First Nations, to make sure that we advance. Thank you. Supplementary. The public accounts recently revealed that this government failed to spend $3.3 billion in budgeted infrastructure cash last year. In fact, the Premier has spent nearly $4 billion less on infrastructure during her first four years than the previous Premier spent during Order. his last four years. This Premier keeps playing political games with her infrastructure projects and promises, especially in the North. She'll drop by to make big announcements, but when it's time for action, she disappears. Yep. This is why crucial projects like the twinning of Highway 17 keep getting delayed. When will this Premier stop blaming First Nations for her own lack of action on this infrastructure file? Thank you, Minister. 
Well, well, Speaker, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit astounded by that question. You know, in 2017-2018, this Premier and our government, we are investing a historic $630 million to wow. expand and repair highways in Northern Ontario, wow. Speaker. And in my entire time, in my entire time as Minister of Transportation, I have witnessed year in and year out members of the NDP caucus do their do their best, Speaker, to try and impede progress when it comes to critical transportation infrastructure. Whether we're talking about the GTHA or we're talking about the northwest of Ontario, Speaker, Premier Kathleen Wynne and our government will continue to make the right investments in the right place at the right times, and we'll do it partnering with our First Nation Speaker to make sure we produce the best possible outcome for them and for the entire people of Ontario. Thank you very much, Speaker. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.